I can get my screen share going for us. Okay, so I've entitled uh, my message for this evening as Intro to Biological Typology. And uh, it's a follow up on our a uh, recent message on the introduction to fractals and typology. And we saw how the branching patterns in nature as uh, uh, described in part by fractal geometry and mathematics uh, reveal this idea of patterns repeating in uh, uh, sim similar patterns not exact, but that have a similarity. It's actually called self affinity or self similarity. Um, and that it happens at different scales from the trunk to the largest branches to the smaller branches to the twigs to the leaves. The, the pattern repeats as we've seen. And uh, we saw that this idea is found all throughout uh, nature and natural phenomena. And here's a picture we had of, of lightning. And it's actually an excellent picture showing that we can really have this idea of branching patterns coming down here. Of, it's like a tree of light coming down from heaven. And of course, what's happening here on earth is supposed to reflect what's happening in heaven. It's really how God designed things. And we see that God is a creator God who wrote things into nature and that reveals his character of love through that creative work that he's done. And I'd like to come to help us to understand that God also wrote principles in uh, of law, the law of love into his created works that help us to better understand the fulfillment of prophecy uh, through this idea of typology. Um, in John 1 1, of course, we're told very well known in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So all things were created by God through Jesus Christ. And as this creator being, he created humans in addition to the things of nature and he wrote into our our biology and into our genetics aspects of his character that we can now see and better understand in these last days i wanted to start with a quote from sister white just as a little kind of introductory thought um, connected with this idea and it's from the great controversy starting on page 343 which is the a new chapter the light through darkness so it's the beginning of the chapter 19 light through darkness in the great controversy the book that god wanted to distribute more than any other other than the bible itself and it's very interesting how she introduces this chapter light through darkness very much connected to the verse we just read. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. We've looked at this quote before in the context of 
typology and this idea of patterns repeating in history. And we've also connected this idea to the, the, the fractal patterns also uh, appear not only in nature, but also in the behavior of created beings as well. And that manifests in patterns of history. And we have the principles of the kingdom of light clashing with the principles of the kingdom of darkness and the forces of the kingdom of light and the forces of the kingdom of darkness that produces patterns that are similar, strikingly similar throughout history, and especially in the work of Reformation. Very, very interesting. Very, continues, no truth is more clearly taught in the Bible than that God by his Holy Spirit especially directs his servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of salvation. Men are instruments in the hand of God employed by him to accomplish his purposes of grace and mercy. Each has his part to act. To each is granted a measure of light adapted to the necessities of his time and sufficient to enable him to perform the work which God has given him to do. But no man, however honored of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of redemption or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. Men do not fully understand what God would accomplish by the work which he gives them to do. They do not comprehend in all its bearings the message which they utter in his name. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. From Job 11, Isaiah 55, and 46. Even the prophets who were favored with special illumination of the Spirit did not fully comprehend the import of the revelations committed to them. The meaning was to be unfolded from age to age as the people of God should need the instruction therein contained. Peter, writing of the salvation brought to light through the gospel, says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister. And we looked at this quote recently in the scripture recently from 1 Peter chapter 1 in our uh, look at the idea of Christ and him crucified as a key pattern and archetype from which we can have other types that are seen through history and are repeating in our day. Yet while it was not given to the prophets to understand fully the things revealed to them, they earnestly sought to obtain all the light which God had been pleased to make manifest. They inquired and searched diligently, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. What a lesson to the people of God in this Christian age for whose benefit these prophecies were given to his servants, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister. Witness the, those holy men of God as they inquired and searched diligently concerning revelations given them for generations that were yet unborn. Contrast their holy zeal with the listless unconcern with which favored ones of later ages treat this gift of heaven. What a rebuke to the ease-loving, world-loving indifference, which is content to declare that the prophecies cannot be understood. Though the finite minds of men are inadequate to enter into the counsels of the infinite one or to understand fully the working out of his purposes, yet often it is because of some error or neglect on their own part that they so dimly comprehend the messages of heaven. Not infrequently, the minds of the people, even of God's servants, are so blinded by human opinions and traditions and false teaching of men that they are able only partially to grasp the great things which he has revealed in his word. 
Thus it was with the disciples of Christ, even when the Savior was with them in person. Their minds had become imbued with the popular conception of the Messiah as a temporal prince who was to exalt Israel to the throne of the universal empire. And they could not understand the meaning of his words for telling his suffering and death. It's a beautiful quote. We could go on, but the idea is, is that there's deeper light that God has for his people. It's to shine greater and greater unto the perfect day, unto our day, that all the prophets wrote for our time, and it would follow these repeating patterns. And that it would be, as it was unfolded, that greatest revelation should be happening in our time. And we should be searching diligently to understand. And we need to look away from the traditions of men. And we need to go, go back to relying completely on Christ through his Holy Spirit, his word, and also his second book of Revelation in nature. And we know we, we, that both Christ himself and his uh, disciples and apostles and the prophets and the uh, uh, the saints of all times have always spent time in God's creation to help learn better of him and his character. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness of Midian, learning about God and his creator, uh, inspired to write the books of Genesis and Job in that communion with God. honoring and exalting the creator and not the creature. And so that's what we're gonna to try to do here a little bit more. Of course, we can see how God made in the beginning, it tells us in Genesis 1, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the scriptures tell us in the beginning, God made man male and female. That is reality. And there are many in our society today who are divorced from reality and actually do not think that there is only male and female to be found among the human race. And this is not just uh, uh, an interesting proposition or theory, it's actually a direct attack on the truth as it is in Jesus found in the scriptures, that the whole relationship between a man and a woman and between God and humanity as important spiritual lessons that were designed of God and to distort the reality of how God made and why he made things that way and what lessons we were supposed to learn through those relationships to help us better understand our relationship with him and its role in the plan of salvation is actually a, a, a direct attack on, on our faith. And we need to understand these things better so that we understand why it's important that we hold to biblical understanding in our, our interpersonal relations as a society and individually. Of course, it also tells us uh, in uh, additional details of that creation of man on the sixth day in Genesis chapter two, it tells us beginning at verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. It's very interesting. Most people, when they think about how God created in the beginning, in six days and rest of the seventh day, 
on each day of creation as god made things uh, god came to the conclusion that it was good at the end of the day and we often think on the end of day six he said it was actually very good but we seem to miss the uh, the point or to gloss over the point that in between on day six it actually there was a time even in perfect eden with no sin where Adam was with God directly face to face and also had the communion of holy angels, and yet it was declared to be not good. Adam alone was declared by God himself to be not good. So day one, good. Day two, good. Day three, good. Day four, good. Day five, good. Day six, not good. And only after he makes Eve and brings her unto the man does he declare it to be good, actually to be very good. It's very important. I don't think we can just dismiss that pattern of understanding. The creation of male and female as opposed to just male was a key part of God's plan of salvation and without which it was not good and the, the only with male and female was it now very good and out of the ground the lord god formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever adam called every living creature that was the name thereof and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. So Adam sees all the animals, they're male and female, but he, and he comes to recognize that there's no one like himself for him to be with, for him to love, for him to be unselfish for. And it was not good. And the word help me actually means to succor. And if you look up the meaning of succor, it actually means to alleviate distress. Adam, made perfect in the image of God, no sin, no pain, no suffering as we know it, face to face with God, angels also and adam was in distress and he needed one to alleviate his distress does god want someone to love to be with him as well is he in distress without us with him with any of his created beings separating from him does that create distress for god See, when god created the angels, there was just one kind of being. And they were, they were asexual, essentially. They were all essentially male. There was no male and female when God created the angels. And there was perfect harmony. Everything was one. It was all in perfect unity, harmony. It says the scriptures say that God and Christ uh, uh, I and my father are one. Well, the angels were all one together with him. And there was no need to create an order of being that was two because everything was in perfect harmony and oneness. It was only after Satan's rebellion, Lucifer rebels and separates from God and the path God had set out for him the path, of, the path of harmony and love and perfection, and he chose his own path, and there became two where there had only been one before. Now there was two. And God's response to that initiation of sin and rebellion was to create this earth and to create man. And he creates a new order of being in his image, and 
They're male and female. There are two. Because there now were two in the, in, in the universe. Those loyal to God and those disloyal to God. It all had been harmony and loyalty before. Now there was two where before there had only been one. Now there's two groups. And a third of the angels join him in the rebellion and are cast out. So God creates this new order of being. And there are two. And not just one. They're male and female. But they're specifically designed by God where the two, as we're going to read here, let's read it. Back in Genesis 2, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and the wife and his wife and were not ashamed. So now God creates a new order of being. There are two, they're male and female. Yet the two can, in a committed love relationship, can become one. The separation, the division that sin had created, God designs a new order of being that's directly designed to solve the problem, to show the way of salvation in the two becoming one again through a holy union. And that's what marriage, true biblical marriage between a man and a woman is supposed to signify to society. And that's why any other model of biblical, uh, uh, any other model of marriage that is uh, endorsed or, or found in society is giving a false image uh, not only of God as a creator, but also of the plan of redemption as a God as a savior and redeemer. And so this mystery of a creation of man and woman, where the two flesh can become one and they literally produce, they literally can produce new life, where the two are permanently fused into one that cannot be separated anymore through children. And this all the, the understanding that we have as Bible believers of the, the, the process of being born again and having to have a, a new life in Christ and how this is represented by the union of a man and a woman in holy marriage and the family and how God designed the family as part of the plan of salvation. Now, when we consider this idea on a more scientific level today, we can see that there's actually many biblical principles that we can actually find the let's look at the process of meiosis just as uh, an example and as foundational is directly related to this idea we'll see of the coming together of the husband and the wife the man and the woman to produce one flesh and new life meiosis is a form of cell division that usually occurs only once in the lifetime of a eukaryote and is vital to the sexual reproduction of eukaryotic organisms. A eukaryote is essentially uh, an organism that has a cell nucleus and can form uh, multicellular complex organisms uh, as opposed to single cell organisms. Meiosis forms gametes or sex cells by rearranging and mixing genetic material, 
which ensures genetically distinct progeny, children, and sufficient variety in the gene pool. So meiosis, the meiotic process, is the process that produces the sex cells in human beings, and it actually it can, it can be in, in, in other animals as well. But we're going to look at it from the, the aspect of human beings. The gametes are the sex cells that the meiosis, meiotic process forms, where we have the crossing over of the genetic material, the mixing of the genetic material between the father and the mother. Now, because meiosis begins with one diploid parent cell and ends with four haploid daughter cells, two division stages are needed. So a lot of science, we don't have to understand it all. Uh, haploid means you have one set of chromosomes and diploid means you have two sets of chromosomes. And so in the parent cell, where the haploid are the daughter cells, those that are produced through the process. So you can see the diploid and haploid. The diploid, you know, it can be created. Di can be connected to two. So we have two sets of chromosomes of the diploid cells and one set of chromosomes of the haploid cells that are produced through two stages of division called meiosis one and meiosis two that are very similar. Uh, Genetic reassortment occurs during meiosis one. Now, there's some interesting aspects to this process that we can consider. This process of meiosis which has two stages. In the first stage, the genetic material crosses over and it takes a very long time. It's a slow process. Here it says it estimates 85 to 95% of the total time for both divisions is spent in this initial phase of meiosis one. And there are even some estimates that it's even higher than 95%. And then, in meiosis two, the same process that happened in meiosis one is repeated, a, a, a secondary division in the, the meiosis one produces two cells. And then in meiosis two, each of those two cells divides and you get four cells in the end. And, but this meiotic process uh, in, in stage two meiosis, happens very, very quickly in a very short amount of time. And of course, we're told, inspiration tells us in Testimonies for the Church, volume nine, page 11, paragraph two, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. So the final movements in the fulfillment of prophecy happen very rapidly. And as we've been looking in our studies on typology, these final movements themselves are revealed by typological patterns that, have, that were revealed in the scriptures. We find typological patterns in history in the great reformatory movements and the great judgments of history and that are revealed in the scriptures and those patterns we've seen and we've been studying how they're repeating in this last generation when the effect of every vision is coming to pass at the same time and a final complete fulfillment of the prophecies. And they're, so they're repeating a pattern that's already happened that we have a record of, but it happens very quickly. The final movements are rapid ones. It's the same in the meiotic process. Meiosis one is akin to history, the type, the type in history that took a long time to reveal the pattern. And then meiosis two is akin to the anti-type in our time, in our day, where that same pattern repeats, but very, very quickly. 
And we're gonna go into much more detail of this process in a study after this week. This is just an introduction, but we'll get into the details and we'll see that every stage by God's grace, I believe, is, of the meiotic process is actually connected to the history of humanity from Adam to the second coming and this process of the plan of salvation and God's dealing with, with the, the nations of this earth are all found in the very process of how a man and a woman and the two can become one. It's all in this written language of DNA in biology, which we're gonna explore further. Now, switch my share here for a moment. In Romans 1.20, we're told, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the creation, in creation is clearly seen the invisible things of the creator to the point that we can understand the, his eternal power in Godhead and be without excuse just from what is seen in nature. And also, amazingly, in Colossians 1, 25 to 27, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. By God's grace, we're going to come to see that not only does Christ need to be in you spiritually, but God's desire and design was that Christ be in you literally through uh, the, the design of your biology and of your genetics, of your DNA. And it's a mystery. Even to, when, here when he's talking about the generations, that's generations are produced through the meiotic process, through sexual reproduction, this uh, uh, sharing of God's creative power in procreation, which he designed to help us understand him better as a creator God and the, the necessity of a law to in, prevent harm and to keep harmony in, in love for all of his created beings. And we see it's connected with the generations. We're going to see more clearly how that is. So these eukaryotic cells, that's just again a cell that has a, a more complex cell that has a cell nucleus and a full set of DNA in its nucleus. The process of genetic recombination is known as meiosis, a Greek word meaning diminution, from the Greek root meon, meaning to diminish, from a further Greek root meon, meaning less. Now, the scriptures tell us in John 3.30, John the Baptist, when he was being questioned about Christ, let's start at verse 26 for context, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. By the way, at the beginning of John 3, Christ explained to Nicodemus that you had to, in order to see the kingdom of God, you had to be born again. This whole spiritual transformation that is mirrored in parallel by the biological transformation that he wrote into the creative process. And that is our reality. And John is being asked about this, Christ's baptism. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, is the whole male and female, 
and the salvation aspect connected with it. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. In uplifting Christ and him crucified, the archetype pattern for all history and salvation and prophecy, we must decrease and Christ must increase continually. Not just now, but for all eternity. May Christ increase and may we decrease. It's all about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so, let's go back to here. This idea of the word meiosis, this meiotic process, this unbelievably, ultimately complex uh, uh, biological process that God created that man can barely comprehend even at this time. And just has a, a, a very rudimentary understanding of an incredibly complex process, yet we can see clear principles in that process from what we do understand. The very word for this process means to diminish or to become less. And this process of God combining his hum divinity with our humanity, we'll see that that's what the male and female union actually represents is about him increasing and us decreasing him becoming all and us becoming less so very interesting that that is how it was even named uh we're gonna get into uh coming up this idea also of the uh chiastic nature of DNA, just as the scriptures have chiastic structure, where the end mirrors the beginning, and there's a, a middle point crossing over. That's the focus. It tells us the connection points of chromosomes during the crossing over of genetic information are known as chiasmata, which is a plural if there's more than one, or a chiasma, which is the singular word if you have just one crossover. The, and here we have a picture of the chiasmata. So the points of the DNA where there's this connecting and crossing over in the meiotic process are actually called chiasmata, which is directly connected to the same root word where we get chiasm in the scriptures. So in God's written word, the Holy Bible, we have the inspiration from the mind of God produced patterns of language and history that are in chiasms or these repeating pat mirror image patterns. And in God's written word in biology, DNA, in the meiotic process of producing that DNA, from the union of the man and the woman, the two becoming one, it also in that process produces what are called chiasmata through a crossing over. And so we're going to look more at that in a future study. We see that these ideas are really very interesting and our scriptural and everything we look at in biology we're going to see has a scriptural basis let's see some other aspects of this now the end products of this meiotic process are what are called four haploid sexual reproduction cells so again the diploid cells are when you have two sets of chromosomes that's when you have actually 46 total chromosomes. And a haploid cell is half that. And so it would be only each of the sex cells, we'll see either, it tells us, their sperm cells in a man are 
and egg cells in the woman, the sex cells are haploid cells. They only have half. Your, your, your sex cells only have one set of chromosomes, not two sets. And one set from the woman combines with one set from the man to create the child who has now two sets or 46 chromosomes, while each sex cell has only 23 chromosomes. And the meiotic process produces four of these sex cells, either four sperm cells in a man or four egg cells in a woman. That's what is produced by this meiotic process, this combining crossing over process of the DNA between the husband and the wife, between the man and the woman. And in a man, the sperm cells, the scientific name is actually gametes, which is a plural word. And the egg cells are known as a gamete. That's actually the same word, just singular. And of course, the plural Greek word gametes means husband, while the singular Greek word gamete means wife. Let's read a couple of scriptures to help us understand. So these, the, the very cells actually mean husband and wife in the, our original language here. Now, in Genesis 3, 16, of course, the scriptures in the New Testament written in Greek as well. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So here we see, because of sin, the woman would have sorrow and conception greatly multiplied. And her desire would be to her husband, just like the church's sorrow is multiplied because of sin. And our desire is to our heavenly husband. And he, our heavenly husband, needs to rule over us to take back the lost dominion that we saw was granted in Genesis chapter one when he made them in his image. Of course, Isaiah 54, five tells us, for thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So God describes himself as our husband, our heavenly husband. He's both the creator and he's the redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And of course, Ephesians 5.23 tells us, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every thing. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we see the relationship between a man and a woman actually is absolutely critical biblically to, if we have a wrong conception of, of human origins and biology and and uh, the reality of male and female, then we're going to have a wrong conception of the reality of, of spiritual things and eternal life and, and our relationship with our heavenly husband who loves us and gave us himself for us. Now, we also... Let's start with this one. We have in Revelation 21, 9, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So the lamb's wife, Christ's bride is spoken of in the book of Revelation. Uh, let's go back 
here. Uh, we also had back in Isaiah. 54, one, sing, O barren thou that did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. So God can work this miracle to make the desolate fruitful. For the two flesh to become one and bear fruit and bring forth new life, that's to God's glory. And uh, shouldn't we come in just with the basic idea that in, in a process that's so central to the plan of salvation, the creation of humanity, male and female, that God would not, in the very biological process that he created, write lessons about the truth of his love for us and his plan of salvation and how that will become reality for us. Now, back share here. Meiosis in a man results in four sperm cells. It's called spermatogenesis. This is a connection to the book of Genesis, spermatogenesis. This is the creation of the four sperm cells. Again, we, we saw that the end products of the meiotic process are four sex cells. So in a man, that's four sperm cells, spermatogenesis. However, in a woman, the end process of meiosis there are three of the daughter cells become polar bodies that are unstable and disintegrate, leaving only one viable haploid cell remaining, a single egg cell, which is called oogenesis. So in the man, the meiosis one, there's a, a division and a crossing over of the DNA and these now two cells instead of one. And then in meiosis two, which happens very rapidly, then those two cells split and become four and that produces four sperm cells in the man. Well, that same process happens in the woman to produce the egg cells, but in her, three of those four cells almost immediately are, are become unstable and disintegrate and cease to exist leaving only one viable egg cell that can be fruitful and bear fruit and become, bring forth new life. And here we have this pattern that we've been talking about in the scriptures, and we mentioned this before, that there are this pattern of three plus one in, a, in patterns of four in the scriptures, where you have three and then a fourth, which is different from the other three in some way. Uh, for instance, we have uh, 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 four gospels and it's generally considered that the first three, they're called synoptic gospels because they're similar and that the gospel of John is considered very different. So you have three plus one in the pattern of four gospels. We also have, of course, in the parable of the sower, there's three types of ground or soil that are unproductive and fail to bear fruit. We have the seed that fell by the wayside, it fell by, upon stony places, or it fell among the thorns. And we have them there from Matthew 13, or you know, Mark 4, and, <laughs> excuse me, I think maybe Luke 8. <clears throat> Uh, but while there was only one type of ground, the good ground fell among the good ground that is productive and bears fruit. So you have, again, you have four in a pattern of three plus one. And the one is always different. <clears throat> and the one involves a transformation. Again, 
See, the, the good ground bears fruit. Bearing fruit requires you to, to go through this transformative maturing process where the seed falls into the ground and dies and then bears fruit, grows and matures and blossoms and bears fruit <laughs> and through a transformation process. And it's only in the good ground that this can happen. Of course, the ground actually represents the state of mind and its willingness to receive the word of God. Uh, but we see this same pattern is found in the production of the sex cells in the meiotic process. This same three plus one pattern. And it's again directly related to the very process of bearing fruit in the human, the fruit of, of the womb, which is symbolic of the spiritual fruit that God wants us to be born again and produced. And the same pattern is found, that's found in the scriptures, in the parable, is the same pattern that just so happens to be found in the genetics. It's also the case that uh, the same thing also happens uh, in the same pattern of three plus one with the transformation is also found in the translation or the tra uh, uh, the translation, the transcription, I believe. Let's see. I believe it's the transcription of of DNA into RNA. DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, is like a blueprint of biological guidelines that a living organism must follow to exist and remain functional. Can't we also describe the, so this is, DNA is like a written language in biology, we're going to see. God has a written word, that's a blueprint, of spiritual guidelines that every living being must follow to exist and remain functional. One is spiritual, found in his written word, and one is biological and, and literal, found in DNA. RNA, or just ribonucleic acid, helps carry out the blueprint's guidelines. Of the two, RNA is more versatile than DNA, capable of performing numerous diverse tasks in an organism, but DNA is more stable and holds more complex information for longer periods of time. It's all very interesting, especially in the light of the current uh, new uh, vaccines that have been put out, where we have mRNA vaccines and DNA vaccines, both on the market today. Um, so what's interesting is when DNA is, is transcribed and becomes RNA, there is a change in one of the four base pairs. And then RNA is then translated to become uh, uh, various Uh, proteins, uh, and that's how the mRNA actually works. That's working in the vaccines. Um, let's see here in the base pairing, it tells us that adenine links to thymine or A to T, and cytosine, uh, cytosine links to guanine, C to G. That's in DNA. There's four base pairs, A, T, C, and G. And A always bonds with T, and C always bonds with G. Then you make a copy of the DNA to perform functions. You don't use the actual DNA to perform any of the functions because you want to preserve the integrity of your DNA long term. But you can make a copy of the DNA that's then brought out into the factory floor to then produce the proteins or material that the, the body needs. That copy of the DNA is the RNA. 
And in the RNA copy, three of the four base pairs, the A, the C, and the G, all are copied exactly the same in the RNA from the DNA. But the T, the thymine, is changed into uracil, U. So the T becomes U. So three of the four stay the same, and the one of the four has this transformation in this preparatory phase for translation. Before you can translate the RNA into functioning proteins for the body to preserve life, you first have this transcription process from DNA to RNA where the copy is made. In order to prepare us for spiritual translation, is God not seeking to copy the attributes of his character in us through a transformation process that then we can be ready for translation to be useful in the life of eternity of God that he's designed for us? So the exact process of how DNA is transcribed to RNA and then translated into amino acids and proteins is, is reflective of the plan of salvation. Exactly. And also, again, includes this three plus one pattern that's so frequently found in the scriptures. And of course, we've talked about before also, there's other times it happens in the scriptures that we actually have um at the cross there were four soldiers who were involved in actually supervising the crucifixion of christ and only one of them when they cast lots got the inner garment that represented the righteousness of christ and only one of them declared this indeed was the son of god so there were four of them there but only one had a transformation experience connected with the cross, the archetype of all history and salvation and prophecy. Very interesting. And also, we know in the scriptures that there are uh, four main uh, uh, groups in, uh, 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 in history, four main kingdoms in history involved in the plan of salvation, involved in the relations of human beings. There's two in the church and there's two in the world always. The two in the church were the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. The two in the world are the King of the North and the King of the South. But of those four, so again, there's four, Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom, King of the North, King of the South. But of, of those, only one, the southern kingdom of Judah, involves a transformation that can bring forth new life. Only Jesus himself said salvation is of the Jews, which meaning the Judeans of the southern kingdom of Judah. It's only through the lion of the tribe of Judah and the plan of salvation revealed in the sanctuary at the temple that was found in Judea in the southern kingdom of Judah, that salvation can be found, that a true transformation of character that can be found. So again, we have three kingdoms that will all be destroyed, or either have been destroyed or will be destroyed, and come to nothing, disintegrate. They're unstable and disintegrate, but one that will bear fruit though it will be in sorrow, longing towards our husband for him to rule over us. Uh, uh, so much more I wanted to cover this evening, but um, well, we'll do a little bit more here before we wrap up. In each, uh, the DNA is in a, there's actually many different forms of DNA, but the most common one that we all talk about is called B DNA, and it's a double helix. 
the bDNA double helix to the DNA structure. And it's comprised of two parallel intertwining strands, the sense strand and the antisense strand. And while these two strands swirl about and rotate about each other, they never meet. Those are the actual scientific name for these two strands, the two strands of DNA that intertwine around each other to make the DNA helix structure. One is called the sense strand and one is called the antisense strand because it actually goes in the opposite direction. One goes in one direction and one's going in the exact opposite direction. Didn't Lucifer, when he chose rebellion and became Satan, didn't he, and every time we choose to rebel, we go in the opposite direction that from the one that God is going in. And the, and the one that God is going in is the one that actually makes sense. And it's the only one that makes sense. While choosing to go against God's way is anti-sense. It makes no sense. So even the very structure of the DNA of itself has this principle at its heart. And of course, when we think about this sense strand and anti-sense strand, we can have some scriptures that talk about this idea. Plus, we can look at all kinds of scriptures, ultimately, that talk about this idea. But let's start with John 15, 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. So Christ is the sense strand. He's the true vine that we need to be abide in him. And we can only bear fruit. Uh, verse five, I am the vine, ye are the branches. This fractal idea, the copies that have a transformation that look like the original through the crossing over the chiasmata. He's the vine, we're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We have to be connected with the sense strand, with the one whose all is the principles of love make sense and are right and good and pure and true. He's the one we need to abide in in order to bear fruit. And of course, John 20, 31, but these are written why this gospel is written. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. That's verse uh, 30, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. You see, the way that we have biological life is also through his name. Christ's name, his character, is written into the biological language of DNA. And it's through that process that we have literal biological life. And it's through that same name, spiritually, that we can have spiritual life through the Son of God, the first begotten unto God. We also have, when we think about the anti-sense strand, we have 1 John 4, 3, and for every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not God, and that this is that spirit of antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So there's an antichrist, an anti-sense spirit that's in opposition going the opposite way that god is going right here spiritually in the scriptures and it actually is interesting that it's connected to the confession that christ came in the flesh that christ became flesh and actually had dna we also see genesis 1 4 god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness. This idea that the sense strand and the anti sense strand are swirling about each other, but they never actually meet is this idea God has made a division between the light and the darkness. And ultimately, that division will become permanent. 
Also Exodus 40, verse 14, verse 20. They came between the camp. Oh, let's maybe start in verse 15, uh, 19. It'll help us understand a little bit better the context. The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. So right in the DNA, you have both the sense strand and the anti-sense strand all entwined with each other, but they actually are totally separate. And God can keep them perfectly separate. God can keep the holy and the pure and the righteous perfectly separate from the impure and the unholy and the unrighteous. All at the same time, and that's his purpose. In the plan of salvation, it's also reflected in how he made our DNA. Luke 11.34, the light of the body is, in, is the eye. Therefore, when the eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. And when thy eye is evil, thy body is also full of darkness. <clears throat> the light and the darkness, the single light, the sense strand, the single darkness, the anti-sense strand. Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he with a, that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they, sh they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The father and sons and daughters, that's the meiotic process. That's this process of the producing the, of the two flesh becoming one and bringing forth new life through this meiotic process is a representation of in biology and it has this sense strand and anti-sense strand all combined together and where we have these repeating patterns of only three plus only one that out of the four has a transformation and brings forth fruit And uh, there's one last thing I wanted to uh, look at. That more later. Um, we saw that the gamete and gametes means husband and gamete means wife with the sperm cell and the egg cells. And also that The fertilization of a human sperm cell and a human egg cell results in a diploid cell that has two full sets of chromosomes or 46 chromosomes with 23 from each parent is called a zygote. And it's derived from the Greek root zygotus, meaning joined or yoked or to yoke. So that this in order to combine the, the combination of the sperm cell and the egg cell to bring forth the new life, the fertilization, that very process is connected with the idea of yoking, yoking to our heavenly husband. We also see it produces 46 chromosomes, which that's a very interesting number in the scriptures. Let's look at that real quickly. In John 2, we can start at verse 19, uh, or we can actually start at verse 18. It says, and then 
answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? When he had made the scourge of cords and, and cleansed the temple, and it tells us, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days will I, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. Well, the temple of our body is based on 46 as well. 46 chromosomes go into the building of the temple of our body. But it's only through the transformation, the yoking with our heavenly husband and the two flesh becoming one and producing new life that is fruitful. It all comes through the temple that was destroyed, Christ's body, and rose again in three days, representing this death and resurrection, born again experience. Isn't that interesting that the 40 and six years is right there. And this spiritual temple that God is seeking to build is connected to this pattern of 46. Uh, we also have in Genesis 4, 25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. The zygote, the new seed from the yoking of the wife with the husband. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and saith unto him, And verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A new creation, a new creature in Christ. And Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the meiotic process and the process of sexual reproduction of the two flesh becoming one of the the sex cells of the man and the woman the, the sperm and the egg coming together to produce the zygote the yoking all is representative of this process of being yoked to christ and having our burden of sin lifted and getting rest from christ and working together with the master to bring others to salvation is all connected to this biological process, which has the same patterns or typologies we're going to see as we examine it further. Um, I think that's enough for tonight. We'll have to continue and the next time we can get together. Here, let's close with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, our most holy creator God. We thank you so much, dear Lord, for all the evidence that you give us that you are indeed the creator God who you say that you are, that you indeed spoke and it stood fast, oh Lord. And your word always reflects your character, whether it's your written word in the scriptures or whether it's the manifestation of your written word in nature and your written word in biology DNA. And despite the taint and corruption of sin, we can still see the, the patterns and the shadows of the original design and creation. And that modern secular science confirms this for us, that it could not possibly be a coincidence that the very scriptures that talk about this process of the union of, the, of how you created male and female, of this union between the man and the woman, this mysterious union where the two flesh become one and new life comes forth through the power of your spirit. And the very process in biology that produces that effect that teaches us about the spiritual truth is exactly in harmony with what the scriptures teach about that very same thing as well. And we've only been able to discover these things scientifically 
in very recent times in modern history and done frequently by uh, uh, secular scientists who have no belief in your truth, Lord, or at least they think. And yet they're revealing the very principles and learning about the principles of a creator God who loves us. And may they come to see your character and love and the reality uh, of creation uh, uh, through the wisdom that you are giving your people in these last days. And continue to lead and guide us to understand more clearly from these patterns in biology to see the connections to the patterns in typology and prophecy that we might have understanding and, and assurance that our understanding of the fulfillment of prophecy in our time is, is sound and in harmony with your revelation, O oh Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. Keep and preserve us until we meet again as our prayer may it be in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise God.